We're going to start the, t t this afternoon's program um, with the F.A. Hayek Memorial Lecture, which has been gener generously sponsored by Butler Schaefer. Um, the lecturer will be Edwin Dolan. Professor Dolan is an economist and educator with a Ph.D. from Yale University. Early in his career, he was a member of the economics faculty at Dartmouth College, uh, the University of Chicago, and George Mason University. In 1974, he served as the academic director and host of the Austrian Conference at South Royalton, which was really the first Austrian conference on the North American continent. From 1990 to 2001, he taught at Mos in Moscow, Russia, where he and his wife founded the American Institute of Business and Economics, an independent, not-for-profit MBA program. Since 2001, he has taught at several universities in Europe, including Central European University in Budapest, the University of Economics in Prague, and more, more recently, the uh, Stockholm School of Economics in Riga, uh, I assume Latvia. Uh, during breaks in his teaching career, career, he worked in Washington, D.C. as an economist for the Antitrust Division of the Department of Justice and as a regulatory analyst for the Interstate Commerce Commission. He later served a stint in Almaty as an advisor to the National Bank of Kazakhstan. Uh, when not lecturing abroad, he makes his home in Washington, San Juan Islands. Dolan's uh, publications include um, Tan Stoffel, uh, Libertarian Perspective on Environmental Economics, which was first published in 1971 and is still in print and is a very good book. I did use that uh, early on in my teaching career. Um, and it was uh, most recent publication date is 2011. And as I, I, I look at it, it seems like it's um, extensively extended. Um, he also has published Foundations of Modern Austrian Economics, or rather he edited that book, which was the book that came, the volume that came out of the South Royalton Conference. And Introduction to Economics, which has been in print in numerous editions since 1974. Um, and I also used that in, in my early teaching career. Um, I'm delighted to introduce Ed Dolan, who will speak to us on the Austrian paradigm in environmental economics. Welcome, Ed. Uh, Thank you. Uh, good to be here. I was uh, very pleased to get this invitation to uh, give an actual uh, named endowed lecture. Not uh, I give a lot of lectures, but uh, <clears throat> very few uh, as distinguished as this one. So uh, Joseph asked me to give some reminiscences about the South Royalton Conference, but that's going to be tomorrow at a separate section. And uh, today I want to uh, sort of do a little bit of case study in the Austrian paradigm. Uh, in the <clears throat> introduction to the uh, proceedings of the South Royalton Conference that uh, I know a lot of you have seen, I talked about the uh, Austrian paradigm uh, from the point of view of Thomas Kuhn's theory of scientific res revolutions and speculated about whether uh, Austrian economics would bring about a uh, scientific resolution, revolution in the sense that Kuhn meant where we'd have a new paradigm that would uh, break through and change the way that people looked at the world or at least looked at their uh, world through their field of studies, whether it was economics or physics or whatever. <clears throat> and uh, one of the remarks that I made in that introduction was that uh, having a unique paradigm, which uh, Austrian economics certainly has, is a necessary condition but not a sufficient condition for uh, s touching off a scientific revolution in Kuhn's sense, that in addition to having the paradigm, first of all, the people that use that paradigm have to use it to address problems that people think uh, are important. Uh, I think that the Austrian school has done very well in that job, especially uh, looking at the variety of topics that are covered in the panel. Here you can see that Austrian economics has colonized all kinds of areas where it used to not being present, whether those are our uh, entrepreneurship and marketing and uh, uh, not, as uh, Garrison was saying this morning, in uh, macroeconomics, no longer just business cycle theory, but also monetary theory and other areas of macroeconomics and so forth. So uh, 
Uh, in that regard, Austrian paradigm has done very well. A second thing that a paradigm has to do in order to uh, spread is it has to offer uh, policy solutions that are of practical value uh, to economic policy, not just uh, pure theory. I think we're going to hear some of those, for example, at the panel later this afternoon on money and the Fed. And then also uh, have to offer solutions. The paradigm Practitioners of this paradigm have to offer solutions that are unique in the sense that they can only be arrived at or uniquely arrived at through that paradigm and can't just, uh, not just parallel solutions to the same problems that have already been solved by some uh, other method. Uh, when I first started thinking about this, I thought, well, I'll just talk very generally about Austrian economics, but I really realized that that was way too ambitious. And instead, I'd like to look at these uh, issues of the progress of the Austrian paradigm just through the lens of one topic that I happen to uh, follow a little more closely than others, which is uh, environmental economics. There's no separate panel here on Austrian environmental economics, but there's been a quite a bit of uh, th quite a few things written on it over the past 40 years. So I'd like to evaluate progress of Austrian paradigm as applied to environmental economics. Now, when I say evaluate, evaluate by what standards? Well, I'm not going to bring in saying the neoclassicals don't like the Austrian paradigm or say that the Austrian paradigm doesn't make sense from the point of view from some ecological collectivist point of view. There would be no point in that. Instead, what I really want to do is evaluate it in the sense of saying, is what Austrian writers on environmental economics say, uh, is it consistent with the, their professed methods that they uh, are using and uh, from the premises that they begin to, that they profess to begin from. In other words, evaluate Austrian economics by Austrian standards. I should say that my remarks here uh, are just a summary of a longer paper. I was asked to submit something to the journal of quarterly, uh, uh, Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics. By the time I got done with it, it was 6,000 words. I don't think you'd want me to stand up here and uh, read that, or we'd be here till dinner time. But I did post a draft of the paper on uh, the uh, conference website this morning. You can take a look at it. I ask you, as the conference rules apply, please not to quote from or cite that draft. I will be revising it uh, before it's published. Uh, but you can take a look at it. Uh, I would make a little preliminary uh, warning that uh, some of the remarks that I will be making today are going to sound rather critical. Uh, I hope, first of all, that they will be taken as constructive criticisms, but they're also going to sound critical because uh, I only have uh, a, a few minutes here this afternoon to talk, and there's no point in uh, repeating all of the uh, many principles of Austrian environmental economics that we all agree on, uh, because why waste time nodding heads about things that we already agree on? Uh, so let me get started here. Um, first of all, what is the Austrian paradigm as applied to environmental economics? Well, I think that it boils down to three propositions or uh, first one is the idea that in contrast to the neoclassical view, which views environmental problems as a problem of uh, optimizing or problems of efficiency, um, that uh, Austrian view is that environmental problems are problems of coordination. Coordination meaning coordinating the actions of separate parties that have conflicting plans for using scarce environmental resources. For example, somebody that runs a paper mill may want to use a river for waste disposal. Somebody downstream may want to use the same water for drinking and farming. They have to coordinate or accommodate their plans to one another because uh, they interact. Uh, second uh, key uh, feature of the Austrian paradigm is applied to environmental economics, I think this applies more widely to environmental economics, is the use of a comparative institutional method. Uh, when we ask, uh, when we want to evaluate whether some approach uh, serves the purposes of coordination or not, what we're really asking is which set of institutions uh, best facilitates coordination or perhaps even we could say which set of institutions least impedes 
uh, coordination. And then the third uh, key proposition, which uh, all Austrian writers on environmental issues agree with, is that the key institutions involved here uh, that uh, determine whether or not uh, actions are or are not well coordinated are those that are involved in the definition and enforcement of property rights. So let's uh, take a look at these principles, see how they've been applied, and I would like to look at three problem areas, I would say here, th that I see, three problem areas in the way these have been applied. Problem number one is what uh, I call the institution gap. Uh, now, if you read uh, Austrian writers on environmental economics, Sometimes we see uh, the approach here in my paper. I have a long uh, quote from uh, writer Graham Dawson, who uh, says this more eloquently than I can summarize here. But the idea is that the proper approach is to privatize environmental policy in the sense that we're going to abolish all existing regulations and leave it to the market as, uh, uh, to leave this coordination problem to the market as supervised by the courts. Let the courts sort out the relevant property rights when they've done that coordination will be carried out. The institution gap here is that there's a big gap between the uh, ideal set of property rights and property rights enforcement mechanisms that's described in these writings uh, and the actual set of property rights institutions and enforcement mechanisms that we have. Uh, <laughs> uh, several pages in the paper devoted to discussing these in detail, but just to boil them down to some simple examples. Uh, what property rights should uh, prevail in uh, when we read, let's say, uh, Murray Rothbard or Roy Cordato or some of the most cited writers on environmental economics, Walter Block. Uh, <clears throat> we have concepts like uh, key concepts of the Austrian paradigm, the idea of uh, homesteading uh, pollution rights, homesteading air rights, homesteading water rights, and so forth. Uh, we have uh, <laughs> the this... Uh, is an example of a principle which is not widely recognized by courts that we have today, although it's a key to the Austrian approach. Um, then we have the question of uh, what are the court institutions we're talking about. The courts, when, when Austrian writers say we should leave environmental problems to be uh, educated in the courts, they're thinking about quite a different set of courts than we now have. As you probably, uh, everybody is well aware in this room, the courts that we have now in this country are not very friendly toward property rights. As a matter of fact, they can be quite antagonistic for them. For example, we have the problem of uh, how courts have uh, treated regulatory takings. We have in our U.S. Constitution, the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendment are supposed to protect property rights against government takings so that we can't take property without due process and without compensation. But as the courts have narrowed this down, this means only that the government can't take title to property, but it can take the use value or the economic value of property through regulations. Uh, you published some regulation on wetlands that suddenly reduces the value of some farmer's cow pasture to zero economically, but he doesn't get any compensation because he still has title to these useless wetlands and so forth. Uh, and um, another area in which uh, courts aren't very protective of property is uh, rights of uh, uh, privacy. We have this current flap about the uh, whether or not the uh, activities of the NSA violate the Fourth Amendment, and the uh, courts seem to be more protective of the NSA than of our constitutional rights. And finally, there are issues of legal standards. Suppose we have these courts, suppose we define property rights through homesteading or whatever, uh, what standards are the courts going to apply? Uh, Austrian writers uh, favor a standard of strict liability in many court cases where Current courts apply a standard of negligence. Austrian writers often favor uh, proof beyond a reasonable doubt where current courts would apply a standard of preponderance of uh, evidence and so forth. So that the courts as described in writings on Austrian economics are very different 
different from the courts we have now. And what I don't see, the missing piece I see here is, is there's there's no roadmap for bridge, bridging the gap here. There's no... Uh, <coughs> we're comparing a hypothetical set of property rights and enforcement institutions with an actual set of policies, environmental policies that are being criticized. Uh, <laughs> This is approach is something that uh, Harold Demsetz uh, used to call the nirvana fallacy, where the flaws of an imperfect reality are compared with a non-existent ideal alternative. And I think Austrians have always been very sensitive to this nirvana fallacy when it's committed by neoclassical economics. For example, when we talk about uh, Austrian approach to and I trust economics. The first criticism we hear is that, well, neoclassical economics has set up this concept, this ideal concept of perfect competition. Then they look out at the messy world of market processes that actually exist. They say, well, uh, the current market process and market institutions don't look anything like perfect competition, so let's jump them all and bring in some ideal regulatory regime uh, some some set of antitrust laws. Whereas what they should be doing, as people like uh, Dom Armentano has pointed out very eloquently, what we should be doing is comparing the actual set of government regulations that we have now, that is our antitrust laws, with what happens in the actual set of markets that we have now, and as he shows in his writings, that our actual set of markets, despite being messy and despite not resembling the ideal perfect competition, do a better job of course coordinating economic activity than uh, markets do when antitrust laws intervene. But still somehow, uh, when uh, Austrian writers write about uh, environmental economics, they, uh, they're, they're falling into the same nirvana fallacy. So I would say that task number one, unfinished task number one for Austrian environmental economics is to do more work to close this gap uh, to compare present institutions with practical institutional uh, uh, practical institutional alternatives, not ideals. Now, the second problem I would like to uh, address, or the second gap in Austrian environmental economics, is the problem of uh, what I call environmental mass torts. Now, let me explain what I mean by this term. A property rights approach has made practical progress and proved of great value in many areas of uh, in where we need to coordinate use of environmental resources. Uh, for example, the folks up in uh, Perk in Montana have written a lot about management of western lands, uh, water rights, fisheries, urban land use, forest resources, uh, even uh, wild game, and have shown that property rights solutions provide a practical alternative that works better than government regulation. But these types of solution are less successful when they're implied with environmental mass torts, by which I mean things like urban smog, acid rain, ozone depletion, ocean acidification, climate change, and so forth, which are characterized by the fact that there are very large numbers of pollution sources, large numbers of victims, and they are widely separated from one another. Um, these, uh, to quote uh, Terry Anderson, somebody from Perk who's written on this, these uh, strain the paradigm. Now, let me explain a little bit why the Austrian paradigm, as applied by writers like Cordato or Bloch or Rothbard, doesn't work for these environmental mass torts. Let's look, for example, about Rothbard. I think his uh, 1982 uh, Cato uh, journal paper uh, on uh, economics of air pollution is one of the most detailed treatment. And uh, we'll see why these don't work for these environment, why the Austrian property version of the property rights approach doesn't work for these environmental mass torts. Uh, Rothbart lays out a set of requirements for successful uh, tort proceedings in cases of air pollution or other mass torts. Uh, there are things like victim bears the burden of proving actual harm. Proof has to be beyond a reasonable doubt. You have to prove strict causal connection between each source and each victim, not that I was um, 
my maple trees were harmed by acid rain coming from somewhere in the Midwest. It has to be from power uh, plant A in Canton, Ohio, or something like that. Uh, and uh, Rothbard also <coughs> imposes limits on joinder of plaintiffs in class actions by defendants, which means that there has to be a separate lawsuit for each polluter and each victim. Uh, now, after going through this list of requirements, Rothbard himself openly concedes that uh, th the burden of proof is insurmountable in case of environmental mass torts. And in fact, he ends up this section by the admonishment uh, that where the burden of institution, burden of proof is insurmountable, then pollution victims, uh, to quote Watt, but the victims have to assent uncomplainingly. They have to assent uncomplainingly to produce it. So in other words, we go through this whole big study of uh, uh, tort laws applied to air pollution, we find out that it doesn't work, and what advice we get? We say, well, so in effect, what Rothbard is saying, to put it in his words into my words, is that, well, some of you may come down with lung cancer as a result of this smog, but hey, those things happen, and if you're going to abide by the standards of libertarian jurisprudence as I've outlined them, there's nothing you can do about it, so just suck it up and get on with your life. Uh, now, uh, there are alternatives to this approach in the property rights literature, although a lot of the alternatives come from uh, people that write uh, property rights-oriented environmental economics outside the, uh, strictly outside the bounds of the Austrian tradition, although some of these get a degree of support by more uh, narrowly Austrian writers. For example, Walter Block seems to be fond. I'm sorry he isn't here today. I'm sure some of these things I'm saying really get him going. I was hoping to get a dialogue. Uh, the paper's going to catch up with him sooner or later. Uh, uh, Block uh, 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 approvingly quotes uh, Martin Anderson as saying that uh, pollution is like garbage and that anybody that pollutes the air is just like taking a can of garbage and dumping it on your neighbor's lawn. That, that ought to be illegal per se, uh, and that there ought to be criminal sanctions for this. Uh, Terry Anderson, no relation, uh, economist up at Perk, who's written a book on free market environmental economics from a non-Austrian version of that, uh, but from also within the property rights school, uh, believes that pollution sources should be liable for harm. For example, if we had privatized roads, owners of roads would be liable for automobile pollution arising from their roads, and that uh, the uh, key differences between this and these approach and Rothbard's approach uh, are, are three differences. First of all, <laughs> if uh, procedural barriers in the courts make it infeasible to totally protect the rights of victims and the right of pollutions. polluters, which way are we going to lean? Are we going to lean over backwards to protect the rights, property rights of polluters, or are we going to lean over backwards to protect the property rights of pollution victims if for some reason or other it's difficult to protect both in full? Uh, second key difference here is uh, who initiates the action. Uh, is the action have to be initiated through a tort process by individual uh, victims, or uh, are we going to have intervention of some uh, public prosecutor who's acting to uh, prevent known harm even when the specific victims haven't filed suit or perhaps the specific victims haven't even been identified? And finally, there's a difference in remedies. What remedies are we going to have? We're going to have pay, uh, payment of damages or restitution of some forth uh, through the tort system, which is the Rothbardian approach, or we're going to have some kind of injunctive remedies or criminal sanctions, which is the alternative approach. So uh, there's a difference here between uh, even Austrian and non-Austrian versions of the uh, property rights approach. Well, does any of this matter? Uh, yes, it matters, because uh, regardless of whose side we come down on, regardless of whether we come down on the side of victims or come down on the side of polluters, uh, unless we can equally protect the property rights of both the victims and the polluters, we are not going to solve the coordination problem. We started out by saying that, uh, and this is something like uh, Roy Cordato is always insisting on, widely quoted as saying that, 
that pollution is a coordination problem, but we can't solve this coordination problem unless we are able to uh, protect the rights of both the victims and the sources. Uh, otherwise, in the Rothbardian approach, where we attack, where we protect mainly the rights of polluters, then there's uh, no incentive for polluters to adjust their behavior to accommodate the conflicting interests of victims. And if we take the alternative approach, uh, have criminal uh, sanctions or injunctive uh, approach against polluters without acknowledging uh, the individual victims, then the victims have uh, insufficient incentive to adjust their activities or their plans to the interests of polluters. The system basically breaks down. What we have here, and now go to problem three. Uh, problem three I call the problem of the missing piece. We have a missing piece, and what's the missing piece in a large amount of this uh, Austrian economics literature is the missing piece is the price mechanism, at least as applied to environmental mass torch. Uh, it's a good Austrian principle that uh, the best uh, mechanism for coordinating the activities of large numbers of people who are widely dispersed is the price mechanism. I've been told, I don't know whether this is really true, but I've been told that Hayek's paper, uh, 1946 AER paper on the use of knowledge in society is the single most widely cited uh, work in Austrian economics. I don't know whether that's really true or not, but some of these people that count citations say it's true. Uh, so how do we get the price mechanism to work here? Uh, well, in areas where property rights are established and enforceable, prices arise naturally out of the, in, uh, uh, out of the uh, interactions of uh, supply and demand. But in the case of environmental mass torts, where we don't have any workable mechanism for protecting property rights of both parties or of all parties, uh, then we're not going to get any prices. So if we're going to have prices at all, if we're going to solve the coordination problem, and if we're going to solve the coordination problem through the price system, since tort law unaided by the price system seems not to work, uh, then we have to have some kind of uh, artificial insemination to uh, inject prices into the system, which means that we have to look at alternatives like emissions trading and pollution fees. Now, I know that as soon as I mention these in an Austrian uh, uh, setting, uh, we're going to get people rolling their eyes and say, no, 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 not that socialist BS again. Uh, but I really think that uh, these mechanisms, uh, that there's a purely Austrian case for reexamining these mechanisms. Uh, so I would like to, uh, and, and at the same time, not only in a positive Austrian case for reexamining them, but I think some of the Austrian critiques of emissions trading and pollution fees that have been ad widely advanced are misplaced. First of all, let me just briefly outline positive Austrian case for uh, emissions trading. This seems to me like the most natural Austrian approach because, in fact, emissions trading would uh, emerge uh, spontaneously from Rothbardian concepts of environmental property rights uh, if they were given a chance, if they weren't blocked by some action uh, of government to prevent recognition of these property rights. Uh, Rothbard uses an example of an airport that is established in the middle of nowhere and uh, starts emitting noise. And he says that by emitting noise into a place where nobody hears it, then the airport homesteads rights to noise pollution, uh, homesteads a noise pollution easement. Then later, uh, somebody comes in and moves around and builds a house in the area. Well, at the time the guy builds a house, Rothbart says, suppose the airport is emitting X decibels of noise pollution. The new ho coming homeowner has no claim against the airport for that because the price he paid for his property reflects the fact that that nuisance was already there. He'd be coming to the nuisance, to use Rothbart's term. But if the airport then expands and starts to emit... 2x uh, decibels of pollution, then the homeowner has a case because the uh, airport has exceeded its, uh, the, the number of emissions that it, uh, that it homesteaded. Uh, so 
out of this homesteading process, uh, as Rothbart sees it, we have a number of pollution existence which is greater than zero but less than infinity. In other words, pollution easements become a scarce good. Second principle that Rothbart insists on is that these pollution easements are separable property. Uh, if you want to trade in the, uh, the, the, the noise pollution easements, you don't have to sell the whole airport in order to sell your noise pollution rights. They could be traded separately. Uh, you could, for example, trade them among different airports, uh, one of whom, one of which was built in a denser area than another, or one of which had uh, a higher cost abatement technology. Uh, and furthermore, uh, easements could be bought up by, let's say, a property developer who wanted to enhance the value of the property so you could buy up these easements and leave them unused and so forth. And as this develops, the price of these homesteaded easements, once uh, congestion has uh, put a cap on the number that were issued, would become uh, w the price of the easements would become the price signal you need to to coordinate ideas. The price signal would signal everybody from airlines, air travelers, homeowners, and so forth. So it seems to me that there's nothing at all here that's inherently objectionable from an Austrian point of view about emissions trading. It's a perfectly natural market mechanism. And I think that instead of dismissing this whole idea that Austrians ought to be willing to engage in practical discussion on how do we facilitate the emergence of such markets and pollution easements with uh, the least amount of state intervention and the least distortion uh, to the market that would emerge. For example, uh, Austrians should be willing to discuss issues like how do we determine which pollution rights have been legitimately homesteaded? How do we determine whether these le how these legitimate, the standards by which these legitimately homesteaded rights are enforced? Uh, how trading should best be implemented and so forth like that. So this is uh, task number two here. I would like to see some discussion of these. Uh, I don't want to talk a lot about pollution fees. Uh, if I'm talking about market mechanisms to a neoclassical audience, there tends to be uh, greater sympathy for pollution fees than there is for emissions trading. Probably the opposite is the case uh, in a more Austrian-oriented uh, argument. But um, I would just like to point out one thing, that uh, the simple objections that, no, no, pollution fees are just another form of tax and all taxes are bad and that's the end of the discussion. This is not an adequate objection. It's not an intellectually honest objection. Um, the reason is that uh, nobody in their right mind would simply propose adding pollution taxes on top of all the taxes we have now. Instead, um, we want to introduce pollution taxes as part of a revenue revenue neutral tax reform in which uh, pollution fees replace some other form of uh, taxes like payroll taxes or corporate taxes or taxes on capital or whatever uh, that also uh, distort the coordination process. In other words, what we need here is an Austrian theory of tax reform into which we can insert this particular type of taxes. Uh, to say that in some anarcho-capitalist utopia there would be no taxes at all is beside the point. That's simply another example of the nirvana fallacy. Instead, we should be taking a more realistic uh, approach, uh, a, a Hayekian or classical liberal approach, which uh, admits uh, the notion that the state uh, is going to exist, that it has some legitimate functions, that its legitimate functions are going to have to be supported by some level of taxation. And the discussion then switches to uh, which kinds of taxes are least objectionable. And I would argue, in fact, have argued elsewhere some length that pollution taxes in many ways are less objectionable than many of the taxes we have now. Uh, now let me turn. Uh, I said that we could make a positive case for uh, emissions trading and pollution fees uh, but I would also like to deal with a couple of what I think are misplaced Austrian objections to uh, the uh, uh, to these mechanisms. Uh, I'll, I'll look at these particularly as developed by 
uh, Roy Cordato. I was disappointed to find he wasn't going to be here. He's another person I could uh, probably get some reaction out of. But uh, the first objection that Cordato raises against uh, equally against emission fees and uh, or emissions trading and pollution fees is uh, the calculation objection. <laughs> Uh, he says, and there's a long quote in my paper that goes, you know, basically to the effect everybody knows the, the, the litany that the central authority in order to implement an optimal pollution fee or an optimal pollution cap would have to know in advance the exact amount of uh, po externality costs and the exact harm done to each victim and the exact abatement costs, not only under current but future technologies and so on and so forth. Uh, I don't think that this is a valid objection uh, for several reasons. The most important one is that this uh, calculation objection really is borrowed from the socialist calculation debate. Uh, but the analogy between the uh, applicability uh, to environmental economics and to the socialist calculation debate is misplaced because the socialist calculation debate concerned uh, the allocation of goods for which perfectly good functioning market institutions were an existing reality, goods like wheat, rubber, tin, and so forth. And basically the argument there was whether or not some hypothetical set of central planning or socialist super uh, pseudo-market uh, Oscar Langa type uh, institutions could do a better job of coordinating these activities than could the actual functioning markets we have. And of course, uh, as everybody knows, here we got the cover of the book right over there, Economic Calculation, Socialist Commonwealth. When you put the question that way, hands down, real world markets work better than socialist planning. Uh, but in the case we're looking at, there are no functioning markets, and this is the whole reason we have a problem. There are no markets for air rights. There are no markets for many types of water rights. There are no markets for ozone uh, pollution and so forth. So uh, the, so the calculation problem is uh, irrelevant there, really. And we're thrown into a situation where we can't make an exact calculation, but nonetheless, uh, we have to either choose to act or not to act. Uh, the position of a uh, administrator of a emissions trading system is not like the position of a socialist planner. It's more like the position of a marketing manager. Marketing manager is supposed to say, well, as corporate president asks the marketing manager, how much should we spend on advertising our new car? Well, there's no scientific way to calculate an optimal marketing budget. Marketing is an art, not a science. It goes by rules of thumb, seat of the pants, judgment, and so forth. Uh, so the marketing manager comes up with a number full well knowing that this doesn't represent any exact calculation. But the one thing that the marketing manager does know, that the fact that he's unable to come up with an exact calculation of the optimum amount does not in itself constitute proof that the optimum amount is zero. Whereas Cordato's objection to pollution taxes or uh, uh, emissions trading really amounts to saying that because we don't know what the optimum level of the tax is or what the optimal, we uh, shouldn't even say tax, because we don't know what the optimal price is for pollution rights, uh, therefore we should do nothing, which means to assume that the optimal price is zero. I think that's, uh, in my view, uh, demonstrably false. Now, the second objection, which Cordado and others uh, bring out against uh, both uh, 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 pollution fees and emissions tracking is uh, the, what I call the compensation objection. The fact that these uh, are deficient in that they do not compensate victims, as tort law uh, ideally would do. Well, on a philosophical level, I'm completely in agreement with that. I agree that uh, the harm uh, done by pollution should be compensated to the victims. Uh, but again, as an objection, in practice, this fails. Uh, again, we have to take a comparative institutional approach 
uh, the proper approach is not to compare artificial price mechanisms with an ideal tort institution that would accurately compensate victims. We have to compare them with the available institutional alternatives. Available institutional alternatives uh, happen to be either a tort law system, which in practice gives pollution victims no opportunity of redress, or uh, existing alternative B is our current system of environmental regulations, which uh, operates largely on a command and control basis and is uh, notoriously uh, faulty. Uh, the second problem here is that if it's impossible both to deter wrongful actions and to compensate victims, it seems obvious to me that it is uh, better to deter harmful actions than to do neither. Ideally, we would both deter and compensate. If we can't both deter and compensate, the fact that we can't compensate doesn't mean that we shouldn't deter. It means that we deter as best we can. Everybody accepts these principles if we apply them to things like uh, shoplifting or rape or murder or something like that. Uh, shoplifter or rapist or murder, uh, the cops grab them and they throw them in jail. Uh, from uh, points of view of some theories of libertarian justice, which I think are legitimate, ideally in some ideal world, uh, there would be some way by which the victims of those crimes would be compensated. But the fact that we can't compensate doesn't mean that we should just let rapists and murderers run around and do whatever they want. Uh, we deter even when we can't compensate. In other words, what we need here is an Austrian theory of the second best. Well, I'll try to wrap up here and still leave a couple minutes for uh, questions. Let me come back to the questions I started with. What progress has there been toward uh, making progress toward a uh, scientific revolution with the Austrian paradigm in this one narrow area that I'm looking at of environmental economics? Uh, have Austrians addressed problems that people think are important? Um, Yes, to a degree, they have addressed uh, properties that they think are important, although I would have to say that there's a disturbing, to me, disturbing tendency in the literature which purports to be on Austrian economics to drift off into uh, Austrian science, or I should say into pseudoscience. That is, that when uh, Austrian writers encounter a problem like climate change, which they realize that their economic tools are incapable of solving, uh, they react by pretending that the problem doesn't exist. Well, it may exist or it may not exist. I don't want to get into that argument here. Uh, I got into a long, long discussion of that in a paper in the Cato Journal in 2006 that I'll refer you to if you want to see that. But the point here is... Uh, it's not sufficient to show that the science in these areas is unsettled. It's not sufficient to show that the science is unsettled because as economists, Austrians ought to be prepared to offer hypothetical solutions on, uh, the, on the basis of uh, what if Chicken Little is right, uh, to use uh, uh, how uh, Terry Anderson puts this. Uh, in his book on Austrian economics, he also expresses some skepticism about these scientific issues, but he says, okay, what if I'm wrong? What if the uh, climate change is real? What would we do about it? Uh, and uh, then second question was, do Austrians offer practical policy proposals or just pure theory? Uh, again, in case of land use, water rights, urban land, fisheries, forestries, these things, yes, uh, the property rights approach in the hands uh, uh, does offer practical alternatives. In fact, uh, these are getting some uh, real respect uh, even within the uh, environmental community that uh, was originally skeptical about it. But in the case of these... Uh, uh, environmental mass torts, smog, acid rain, climate change, and so forth. Really, uh, the leading Austrian writers have very little to offer but pure theory, and they reject out of hand practical alternatives that might actually uh, accomplish some of the goals that they profess to pursue. The third question I asked was whether Austrians have offered solutions that are unique, uh, not just a different way of achieving uh, 
the same result as the dominant paradigm. Well, I don't think that the Austrian uh, economics, the Austrian literature as applied to environmental economics is really uh, always unique uh, that this property rights approach uh, has uh, been uh, also well developed within uh, neoclassical or mainstream economic traditions and comes to much of the same conclusions. Uh, on the other hand, in areas where Austrians do have something uh, unique that they can contribute to this discussion, for example, a theory of uh, emissions trading that was built on free market principles of Rothbardian uh, homesteading of pollution rights, uh, here is an opportunity to make an original, purely Austrian uh, conclusion that I don't see, uh, that I just don't see. So when we put all these things together, really what I would end by saying is it seems to me that Austrian economics, Austrian paradigm is applied to uh, environmental economics as a sort of a split personality. Uh, on a theoretical level, Austrian, write, Austrian writers seem to delight in claiming the moral high ground in saying, yes, we're environmentalists too. Uh, pollution is a violation of the property rights of pollution victims, and it's uh, naughty, and we should, uh, shouldn't allow it. But on a practical level, really, uh, many uh, concrete upshot is that uh, a lot of the Austrian literature leaves pollution victims in the lurch. They invite them to sue, but then uh, they construct a set of legal standards which leave uh, the, pollu uh, the pollution victims with zero chance of uh, prevailing in court. And that although uh, tort law fails to solve these problems unaided, uh, many Austrian rights oppose all government measures to collect uh, to protect pollution victims, however these are done, whether through regulation or through measures to make pollution pay, and uh, so forth. Uh, so, um, really, when it comes down to it, the, the environmental economics, as professed by some Austrian writers at least, ends up being a, a polluter's dream and a victim's nightmare, offers very little of practical value to secure property rights, uh, does nothing to encourage coordination, and really ends up not doing very much to promote uh, libertarian justice. Thank you.